Tonight, let me bypass even the appearance of working up to some more complex finale to what I had to say, and let's just jump right into the hard stuff and start off. The kinds of questions that everyone finally experiences, and even if you had no particular wired up background to be philosophically inclined, this still affects you in some way you will have your own systems enunciate this kind of question, questions. And that is, if everything is as predetermined, as everything is as mechanical as it would appear to be, if indeed we seem to be within a closed system, if indeed nothing, speaking apparently on a physical basis that no energy, no matter can be produced, nor can it be destroyed. Things are not coming in from nowhere, nor are they leaving to some great nowhere. Then how can anything change? Or worse, how can anyone change? How can people change? If everything, if everyone is as it must be, which it sounds as though I keep either saying that or hinting it so strongly that I must be saying it, and then you believing that in fact you see it at times. How can one cease, or how can one escape falling into some great honey wagon full of terminal frustration? If everything is as it must be, if everyone is as they must be, how can anyone change? If, for instance, a person feels the desire to change, and if they do so, then was that not inevitable? If somebody feels the need to change and they do not change, cannot change, was that not inevitable? And on that basis, what's the use? What's the difference between us sitting here, you sitting there, and thinking, well, I want to, whatever my term for the month or the year is, I would like to ignite higher circuits. I wonder why I want to. Well, I've always had some kind of feeling I wanted to do something. I didn't know what to call it until I met him, and now I'm calling it, I'd like to get higher circuits operating. But why is that? Well, I don't have a choice. Some people want to and some don't. I used to know some people back in Oregon or Tennessee that wanted to, but now I know if they were here and I tried to talk them into this, they wouldn't like this. They wouldn't hear this, and so they wouldn't try. They wouldn't try on the basis that I am trying this. So. I must be destined to try and do this, and I must be destined to end up here, and other people must be destined, even to think they want to, or they are destined not to end up here, and they're destined, if I'm in the right place at the right time, then they're destined not to find the right place at their right time. What's the sense in any of this? Not only what's the use in trying, but assuming there is a use, and that nobody stops along the way and actually chokes on that, not only what is the use, but how is the use? How can you find the use if there is a difference between you being involved with me and this? If there is a difference between that and your Uncle Charlie or Fred being involved with still attending the temple or the church or the mosque, and now you are fairly well convinced, perhaps even blaming it partly on me, that they're wasting their time. They're wasting their time expecting to ever learn anything extraordinary. But what is the difference then in you and them if you can't do anything? Or if something does seem to happen, if it was inevitable, what kind of fun is that? How can you take any credit? How can we say that you did anything? Is that a part of it? Is it important to be able to say you did, a, did something? If it's all just happening, what's the sense in trying? If it's all going to happen, if indeed I am what I claim to be in some of my drunken states at time, that I am the single source at this level, at this part of the world, or some whatever it is I say when I'm in that condition, and that you accept that, even if it's true, then so what? It was all just going to happen anyway, right? You were going to end up here, I was going to end up talking like this and doing whatever it is I'm doing, and you wouldn't end up reacting to it in a certain way, so what's the point? It was going to happen anyway, 
And then, plus, how about all these little Mickey Mouse rules I throw out? Don't be drinking, don't be taking drugs. If it's going to happen, and it's inevitable, what's the difference? Why should I mess up a fairly enjoyable thing by throwing in little rules like that? It's not going to make any difference. If anything extraordinary is going to happen to you, through your involvement with this, it was going to happen. And by me saying, don't do this, and don't do this little thing, and be sure and do this other little thing, what difference does it make? What difference does it make, or how can it make a difference, or perhaps another way of putting it, is there some reasonable approach to take to this before you understand it, assuming, of course, that it can be understanded? Let us now consider this, that you could look at as being the higher circuits in man that are designed for an ongoing venture, that is the higher circuits designed for ongoing evolution, not the lower ones. Now, allow me to remind you one more time, and one more time again, to talk about the circuits, we're talking about things that are intertwined to such a degree that it's not even just limited to a 3D world of me saying if there are such circuits as I describe as yellow, red, and blue, they're not just a nexus in here physically, they are a nexus into other dimensions and they overlap to such a degree that once you understand it, it is almost frivolous to talk about circuits in the same way that it's absolutely frivolous for anyone who understands anything to now try and think in such a way on the good old time basis of the dichotomy of the mind and the body. But trying to keep that in mind, I go back to where I was, that it is the higher circuits, speaking as opposed to the lower ones, that are designed as an ongoing open-ended venture subject to change subject to evolution, compared to the older, lower circuits, which are, relatively speaking, this is true enough in the 3D world, but I just remind you that all such data is always imperfect, is imperfect, but the lower ones, relatively speaking, are fairly well established, and they are much less applicable to any real change. It is like or to say that they are not applicable to any, relatively speaking, sudden change. And by sudden, we're talking about the kinds of changes taking place in man's higher circuits within periods of hundreds and thousands of years, that that would be sudden to the lower circuits. It would be sudden and it would be substantial if the lower circuits had changed in man even within, say, the last 2,500 years in the same way as the higher circuits. In some of you, it would be sudden and substantial if your lower circuits had changed as drastically as your higher ones, even if the higher ones could only be measured to have changed that much, which would be substantial. If it was just barely measurable in the 3D world, there would still be substantial change in the higher circuits. Now, in the lower ones, if such, of this minimally measurable change took place in your lower circuits, it would be astounding. People that hadn't seen you in a while would go, good God, what happened to you? That sort of thing. And that's just on the surface. It is the basis also, I might point out, that old dogs are not given to the need for new data. It's not only that old dogs cannot be taught new tricks, they do not need new tricks. And your old dogs are the lower circuits. It's too late to, in some way, to try and profitably teach them new tricks if that was the only apparent payoff. Now, there are, of course, ways to use that. There are tasks that I pointed out myself, and there are ways I've pointed out to you that you can just find your own task to try and always do something drastically, even in the lower circuits, because it will create a more conducive atmosphere and higher circuitry for other change to take place. 
but to believe that just change of some kind of lower circuits is going to bring about the kind of substantial change that this is involved with is to be misled. That's like believing that you can fast yourself, eat yourself, not eat yourself, chant, pray, whirl, do yoga, run, dance, to do something in the lower circuits that will bring about a kind of higher circuit enlightenment. With those people in life, and this does of course happen with those that apparently have some success, it apparently has some success, but they are ruined. Nothing is ever possible for them again. It is not the kind of real change that we're involved with. You could look at the early days using my revolutionary picturization and terminology onwardly. You could look at the kind of recruitment days or your days of being a recruit as being a time when you're attempting to reorder, to reorient the connection and the difference between the lower, older circuits and the younger, higher ones. But that's a lot of what's going on now. That's a lot of what seems to, with some of you, to be these fits and starts that you believe you're beginning to understand something different that apparently you can go on for days or weeks or months and not suffer, for instance, as you seem to have suffered for the previous 30 years, and that seems to be back on you. A part of this time, even though it may not seem this way, is a kind of reordering. Again, you might find yourself confronted with your own internal question of, well, am I causing the reordering? What kind of control do I have over it? And apparently none. It just seems to happen. Therefore, am I back to the question of what's the use? Sometimes it seems to happen and sometimes it doesn't, and I cannot even pinpoint that something I specifically did seem to have triggered this. What's the use? The question I proposed or suggested that could be asked about what kind of approach to take, then let me be a little more specific. If indeed it still would appear to you that you are living in a closed system, that I even seem to have verbally detailed and sketched out one so that you are left with a feeling of what's the use, what can I do other than what I am predestined to do, then one approach, one quite valid approach, would be to look at it as being a kind, and this is very temporary, very imprecise, but you can look at it as being your own kind of apparent battle between good and evil, all in quotation marks, of course, and all with a certain kind of grin, and you've got to understand what I'm talking about in your own way. It's your own kind of battle between good and evil. It's your own kind of struggle going on between the older, lower circuits and the younger, higher circuits, the latter being the only ones designed by life in man to be capable of an ongoing change. Then the battle apparently becomes a commitment, a battle between your higher commitment to do something, in this case to do this, to do whatever it is I seem to be talking about for this week or this month as opposed to what seems to be just your natural inclinations. Now there could be voices, there should be. There are voices in you that then could say, well Jesus, that's no different than somebody trying to be a good Christian or a good Jew or a good Muslim. But the voices in them say, well yes, I would like to really be a true Muslim, a slave to Allah. I would like to be living the kind of upright life that would throw me into mystical states wherein I would commune directly with the higher forces. But then there's that part of me that wants to do everything that a Muslim is forbidden to do. And I seem to be no different than my neighbors or my brother. So what's the difference in that and this? It still seems to be that it's just the old battle that something in me wants to do better, whether it be defined as do better by the Old Testament, do better by the Koran, or do better by my kinds of sketchy, shaky descriptions. What's the difference? 
All right, you've got to operate on the basis for the time being that there is a difference. You've got to operate on the assured basis that there is a difference in making some kind of effort now that you've gone as far with this and the things that just seem to happen to you and in you, that there is a difference. The question of, well, the difference I perceive, is it based on my own understanding or has life simply ordained that I be one of the few people, maybe in the world, that seems to sense this kind of difference? If I'm just destined to sense this, we're back to the question, what difference does it make? The difference it makes is a kind of accountability. The difference it makes is attempting to create your own revolution on the basis that if all of this be true, which is not, it's imperfect, imperfect data, if all of this be true, then it's got to be a revolution with no purpose, no possible payoff, or no payoff that I can see. It's got to be rebellion almost for the sake of rebellion. So, so, it's got to be evidently just a struggle between all of my lower, older circuits that seem to be the common denominator between me and everyone else, and then these dreams I seem to have had all of my life and now seem to have been focused presently on this, that there is a continuing battle between them, that I seem to be struggling to try and do something different, and I keep wanting to do the same old stuff. The commitment is not to let whatever seems to you now to be the motivating force, whether it be destiny, predestination, whether it be the inevitable forces running through everyone, changing from person to person, from time to time, and over which you may have no control. Nothing can be done, nothing can be attempted unless you operate on the basis that what appears to be the commitment coming from the higher circuitry has got to override the lower ones. If not, you are going to be a participant in the celebration of the common man and the real revolutionists cannot join in these celebrations. They have been spoken about, sung about, poeticized about since the time of the Greeks, right up until today. Poems written, symphonies, ballets, in praise and celebration of the common man. And you cannot join in the celebration of the common man unless you enjoy being him. If you find something, and I am very well aware, I am not so illiterate, so hard-hearted, not to understand, not to be able to feel the kind of poetry, the kind of songs about the praise, the recognition of the common man. And it goes off, of course, into certain poetic and literary areas at times that apparently we're praising those who get out and do the hard labor, plant the corns, lay the foundations to buildings, and et cetera. But when you get down to the actual celebration of the common man, you are celebrating that which is most common, you are celebrating that which is most mechanical, you are celebrating that which is most resistant to any change, to say the very least. And if you do so, you're going to continue to imitate, if not outright be that, which you celebrate. If you want to celebrate the common man, you might as well offer yourself as a uh, at least your photograph, to be the poster boy or girl for the common man for the upcoming decade, if not lifetime. There is nothing to celebrate in the common man. Leave it to the common people to celebrate the common man. Somebody's got to do it, let them do it. What are you going to celebrate? And it's far beyond, as I said, the passing literary notice is made of the honest hard labor of our common people. That is a small part of being common, real small. And most common people, if they could get out of doing common labor, they would do it. They'd do it by deception, treachery, force. What is there to celebrate in being common? 
all human emotion. You can celebrate being greedy, revengeful, hateful, jealous, angry, murderous. You can celebrate all that. You can celebrate being dumb. You can celebrate being just as dumb as everyone else. You can celebrate being just as nearsighted as everyone else. If you want to see the celebration of the common man, just find yourself at your lowest point and go look in the mirror. And see, if you then want to pull out a party hat and one of those whoopy things to blow on, then do it. But you'll just stay there in the bathroom in front of the mirror rather than come back here and annoying me. There is nothing to celebrate. I know what commonness is. There is nothing to celebrate about it. That is not how life is growing. Life is not growing at the common level. That is not the area within man through which life expands. It's up here. That should be obvious to you by now. That is not that mystical. It's not that occult. If there is anything that is obviously, by now, open to any potential change, real change, what is it? It's up here. Another change, I might be able to go through some extraordinary regimen and lose some weight. So what? What does that do to me? I've done that before. Did I feel any closer to the gods? I can put on weight. Did I feel any more enlightened? By feeling like, well, now I'm bigger, I might be able to push around a larger group of people than I used to. Did I feel an increase in my wisdom? What has changed, if anything, through this activity? Now, many people feel that there has been, correctly so, an alteration in their feelings, in the blue circuitry, the blue systems. But the real change, where is it that this seems to touch? Where is it that I seem to be able to, at times, worm my way into your little existence? It's not through these small red circuit demands of you not eating meat or drinking booze or be sure and get exercise. That's just to increase the available and usable background. Where it seems that this can get in is up here. It's the younger circuits that are still malleable. You could see the real revolution is being in an, uh, an attempted escape from the confines of the common. And it does not mean, of course, that overtly you have got to be that weird. But as always, you might notice how life has produced within itself groups of people apparently pursuing this, and their most obvious activity is in what? Is in appearing to be uncommon. And through what great stroke of understanding does such things come about? We'll all shave our heads and paint purple bullseyes on the tops of our noggins. <laughs> and we'll all wear green pantaloons and dresses. Now, of course, then you can say, well, I am no longer common. I am now somebody exceptional. There's some name for this group, and you can say, yes, I'm one of them. It's obvious I'm looking at me. Nothing wrong with that. If that's what any of you want, you know where they meet. They meet in every large city, some group like that, and they appear to be uncommon. The real revolution is to escape the confines of the common, but it is not through this kind of behavior. It is not through that which is actually just centered on the red and even slightly blue circuits. This kind of real revolution is secret. And I might also point out that it is not dependent upon the accord and the consensus of the people in you the common man. Remember, capital T, capital P, the people in my state of not only Slavovia, but the state of Fred and Mary, that the real revolution is not, cannot be dependent upon some sort of consensus going on. The common people in you will never get together and decide we now know enough 
we will now hold some sort of vote, we'll have a referendum, we'll decide by God. I mean, now we've gone this far, we've been involved with this for years, and I think all of us, from top to bottom, all the little joggers in me, all of the little thinkers in me, all the little artistes in me, all of the little bankers and merchants in me, we've all picked up little pieces, perhaps, of some worthy data from all of this. So now, can we put it all together and decide to make some specific move that would be in our benefit? That is not the basis of a revolution. That would apparently be the kind of activity that would go on with, what do they call those strange institutions? Oh, I know. Colleges of theology. It gives a whole new feel, I would say, to that chestnut of a word, oxymoron. At any rate, apparently one could study one could accumulate knowledge and put it all together, or begin to put it together, and there would arise within one a kind of consensus. It would be a kind of deserved, a kind of learned, a kind of progressive enlightenment that suddenly would go overnight, and it all came together. We held a referendum. We held a vote and decided, yes, we will cease being as dumb as we used to. Yes, yes, we will now listen to the new noise coming out of these higher circuits that I seem to have at times. I will begin to listen to that and to operate on that basis. The revolution does not come about, cannot come about, being dependent upon the common man, man in the plural, the people in you, through some kind of accord or consensus on their part. To believe that is to believe that this is finally, logically going to make sense. But at one meeting night, I'm going to say, all right, look, I brought in my invisible mystical lasso, and I'm going to round up all of these months and years of all this stuff, and we'll put it all together in capsule form, and I'm just going to give it to you. I'm going to spell it out, and most of you are going to go within the next hour or five minutes, going to go, oh, my God, it was right before me all the time. that you're going to have some kind of internal plebiscite of, and everything is going to come together and you will all agree internally, ah, so that's it. That is not, I must tell you, that is not a revolution. Revolutions do not happen by accord. Rebellions do not, are not fueled, nor sustained by consensus. In case you never noticed, if we we're now going to jump out here right quick, in the external world, Revolutions, in fact, normally fall apart out here on the basis the revolutionists themselves have no accord. They're dangerous. Get a band of revolutionaries, and if they seem to be taking over and there are ten revolutionaries, next thing you know, you've got ten potential new governments. <laughs> By the time that they apparently are overcoming the ruling powers, then they've got nine new battles, that is, each one of them, against the other nine would-be revolutionists. What it amounts to is too much of a wait and see. It is too much of life arranging the lower circuits in such a way that it affects even you people. That there is coming a day in some way that there will be an internal consensus on my part. That in some way I am still a common man. In some way I'm still part of the people. I'm okay. There's still parts of me that is going to come in line. There are parts of me that right now I know are fairly untrustworthy. There are parts of me that in the lower circuits perhaps, as you describe them, that I cannot, upon which I cannot totally depend, but they're going to see the light. They're going to be finally won over by the, may I say, the emerging for the logic and reason of all of this. I just know they will. And once that happens, boy, 
I'll be a sight to see. I'll be a force to be reckoned with. The real revolution is to escape the confines and the hold of the common man. And it cannot operate on the basis of accord or consensus. And further, the real revolution has no proper season. You cannot wait until the proper time because all real revolutions occur contraire at improper times and they are and they are executed by improper people that is they are not executed by the common man the decent folk of the city there is no proper time there is no planting season there is no predictable harvest time there is no revolutionary season in the lower circuits and their effect, the way they're already wired up in you, the inevitable in you and everybody, was I must wait until the right time, I must wait until I have a better feel for this, I must wait until there is more a feeling of consensus within me that I pull myself together or that some miraculous force has kind of pulled me together and I'll know that the time is right. If the time is right, it's not the right time. There is no proper time for a revolution. For a revolution to take place, I assure you, all the common folk, that is, all the people in the city, including the ruling powers, everyone, if they were asked, if they had time to be asked, is this the right time for the revolution? Everyone, from the king on down, would say, well, no. I mean, if, if there had to be a revolution, I swear to God, today, right now, was the worst time imaginable. Come back and ask them a week later, a month later, and you get the same answer. And of course, don't worry about kings and street sweepers out there. It's in you. Yes, I'd like for something extraordinary to happen. Well, from what you told me, here's a, right here's, a, if this is not the time, may I suggest to you that this is awfully close to a good time? Yeah, but it happened at the worst possible time. When you're living in a 3D world of consciousness like that, you must admit it's hard for me to say anything else. It's hard for anybody to say anything else. To say, this to me looks like a splendid, fortuitous time, and you say, well, that could be. I know what you're about to say. I know what you're getting at. Yes, yes. Except this kind of good time could not have come at a worse time. <laughs> it is only the common man it is only the people that believe that there is a proper time. That change must be made by proper people. And perhaps the Pope will come to his senses, and, or the church, my religion, the political structures, our cultural institutions, the changes that I do believe would be beneficial, perhaps they will evolve, that the times will become more pregnant, and in the due time, our society, my religion, my people will deliver. They will give birth to a new day, a new understanding, a new outlook, a new Buick for all I know. <laughs> if you're waiting for that, why did you come here? That kind of bus stop is back at the temple. It's back with your family. It's back at the church. The common people believe that there is a proper season and that things must be done and executed by proper participants. I would suggest to you, this is really off where I was going, but even to take damned old historians, stories of these great religious figures and religious founders throughout history, just glance back right quick. Just what certain views of history show of them, or seem to tell of them over the ages. Do they really sound like, from one quite valid and correct view, do they sound like, do they feel like that they were proper men, proper people? If you think so, I, I advise you to think about it again. I further advise you, suggest to you that I know more than history does. 
Now, I'm strongly advising you to rethink that. I mean, if you think things like, boy, I bet Moses was a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> or Jesus, starting a religion based on love. Wow. You know, he had to be the proper guy, and the rest of them improper, right? Look what they did to him. And I suggest to you strongly, if there was ever a position that needed to be rethunk, you're up to your armpits, if not your mammary glands in it. Another aspect. There is something terribly amiss in what you have believed to have heard and gotten from this thus far if you do not see the use of or if you don't at least perceive the need to see the use of times of extreme pressure in your life, points of pressure, times of trial, if you do not yet see the need to use that, you by God better see that you should see the need to use those. <laughs> you are missing absolutely critical cracks. You're missing times that you can jump, as it were, almost from one universe to another. You can jump time frames, but it always appears to be improper times. It's never the right time. The right situation is never going on. Uh, God, I can't resist. Here I go, I'm jumping back in so-called history. I'm just using fairy tales. You people know when I'm not taking this seriously. But do you believe some of these, like these mystical tales of these religious figures these in history, or the mythical tales of the Grecian and Roman and other gods. All these many gods and godlike figures that these apparently terrible things happen to them. Being crucified, being murdered, being tortured, being hounded. Ordinary consciousness looks back. These poor people, these poor guys trying so hard to do good stuff and nothing but terrible crap happens to them. I assure you that you don't see anything about it. Or if you can get beyond 3D consciousness just for a couple of moments here, if that were true, that if one of these figures, mythical or otherwise, is being jumped upon by his time and place's version of Philistines, and here they are torching him or her, misusing him, laughing at him, maybe about to put him to death, and that person, this apparent religious, spiritual, intellectual hero, is going, oh my God, you know, what's happened to me? How did I get into this? If that was what was going on, then I suggest to you again most strongly that you rethink what history calls heroes, and you doubly rethink what you think is being a hero, because I suggest to you that if they were worthy of any revolutionary fame just amongst us, what they were saying was, ooh. <laughs> What a close call. I almost missed this. I almost fell right in from here to suffering. I mean, just because they're cutting off my privates. Just because, just because they got knifed in my throat and they've broken all of my ankles. I almost went from there right into suffering, and I would have missed it. In our day and our time, of course, you don't have to look far, look forward to, or fear such red circuit damage because you've got it going on in other ways today. But everyone takes it personally. Everyone takes it as being improper. Everyone takes it as being out of season. Everyone takes it as being against my best interest. 
everyone takes it personally and you celebrate the common man because you continue to be him. You continue to be just as common as you can be. If there's something more common than dirt, you're it. Out in the bushes, out where the revolutionists and even the recruits should be, you got to understand that there's a purpose for hard times. There's a purpose for so-called hard times even in the city. But out in the bushes, the hard times should produce solid people. I wanted to say, but I was afraid it'd frighten you, but now that I've said I almost said, I'm going to say what I almost said. The slogan here should have been that out in the bushes, hard times produce hard people. But then some of you don't want to hear words like that, that, ah, this is not to produce hard people. <laughs> that, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound even proper. So I won't say it. At least any of you think, perceive what I've been talking about for the last 20 or 30 minutes as being too involuted, convoluted, obtuse, obdurant, opaque, difficult, strange, and are weird. Let me point out that the passing description I was attempting to sketch out for you as your own internal struggle, whether it be in the perceived closed system wherein everything is inevitable, success or failure, of it, the proper approach, or one of the proper approaches now being as you seeing it as a struggle between your older, lower circuits and the higher, younger ones, let me point out that people that apparently were at one time seriously involved with me in this activity here, those that either went off on their own or that I threw out, they all, in both cases, went out on the basis, the first one, to what seemed to be the orientations of their life centered around the lower circuits caused them to lose the, what they perceived to be the necessary energy to fuel their commitment, the upper ones. And so they just felt as though I cannot continue this. Something's happened. In the other cases, the more common cases where I've had to throw people out, it's always been on the basis that their lower circuits overcame the upper ones. No matter what apparently were the individual circumstances, that was always it. Everybody talks a real good game. Everybody, not just people out there in life, not just the common folks, you folks, everybody talks a good game. I've had to throw people out here throughout the years. Some years ago, one person specialized in sending me little love notes, is what it amounted to, about how they had a continuing awareness of how much they had received from this and how their whole life had changed. And had it not been for meeting me and being involved with this, that their life would have been the, of the most crude, mundane, common sort. And simultaneously, they were laying the lower circuits, cause them to do one of the few things that I absolutely have forbidden in here that I told you that the group could not stand, could not hold up to. And people will talk a good game, and the lower circuits will continually fight for supremacy as they're supposed to. And inevitably, with most people, they will win. It's been many, many years since I recounted this story. And there are versions of this all over the world. Since I thought I made it up, I've run across it everywhere. But the old story was, couched in religious terms, as a man, a woman dies and finds themselves before the gates of paradise, the payoff of their life. And there's a sign that says, when the bell rings and the gate opens, come in quickly. And the person waits and waits and waits and waits. Who knows, months, years, God knows how long, who cares? And they finally take a nap. Finally, after centuries perhaps, but we're talking strange places now outside the 3D world, 
thousands of years a person waited. And finally he took a nap. Do I have to tell you what happened? <laughs> you people know what happened. And just that split moment, they just fell for a second. The bell rang, the gates opened, and by the time they heard it, the noise that really caught their attention as they awakened was what? The gates closing. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, gee whiz, I shit. And I, I've thrown people out, and without exception, I immediately get back a note, a letter, and what does the letter say? They all have different signatures, but they all say the same thing. Ooh, boy, have I learned a lesson. Because now I realize just for one split second, I let myself go. But boy, I've really learned my lesson. All you gotta do is let me come back because, boy, have I learned something from this. Well, not only can they not come back, but they hadn't learned anything from this. It was inevitable. And everybody, all of you people sitting here, you're that far away from inevitable. Even if I suggest to you that this is not a closed system, it just appears to be, if there was some way that new energy, it can flow in. That is, so that your apparent interest in this not be out of the ordinary. Even if that be true, I'm telling you, you live that far from the inevitable. You live that far from going, it just is, it's not an attack, and you're an idiot to think otherwise. And you'd be the very ones that someday I may have to throw you out or you'll drift away, but if I throw you out, you'll go, ah, oh, ah, oh, good grief. I stuck with this for a blank number of months or years, and I knew better. And right there for one split second, I let my sex organs take over of my thought organs, my commitment organs to this. Ah, oh, yeah, I see, yeah, I know how you did it now. I know how you threw me out, but hey, let me come back tomorrow because, phew, I've learned an astounding lesson. That's an astounding lesson. Number of months or years, and I knew better. And right there for one split second, I let my sex organs take over of my thought organs, my commitment organs to this. Ah, oh, yeah, I see, yeah, I know how you did it now. I know how you threw me out, but hey, let me come back tomorrow because, phew, I've learned an astounding lesson. That's an astounding lesson. The common man, the common man is led around by the lower circuits. That is why nobody can be a real Jew or Christian or Muslim or Buddhist. That's why. There's nothing wrong, they're not supposed to be. But everybody of all religious stripes and persuasions are sitting by the gate. They don't have to die. They're sitting by the gate and they believe, and we won't question this, they believe that they now understand what it takes to be a good blank. Fill it in. But the gate says, all right, to be a good blank, step in the gate as soon as the bell rings because it'll close quickly. And everybody, let me set this down so I don't spill it. I mean, everybody, <laughs> almost without exception on this planet will finally go and don't ask me why but this whole gonic arrangement is such in life that every time it's your turn to go your gate's going to open the bell's going to ring and it's going to go wham, and you go oh oh my god have I learned a lesson? Let that gate open one more time, I've learned my lesson. There's no lesson to learn. It's too late, there's no lesson to learn if you're not gonna learn it now. If you are not wired up, if it be inevitable, let's take the worst view. If you're not wired up as such that you can hold a commitment, or that you can hold a threat, or that you can hold a promise I make, then don't do this. Don't be led in this way. It's natural. Don't do this or it'll ruin everything else. Or don't do this or I'll throw you out. And even if you hear it as a threat that's serious or even if you hear it otherwise, it's like, oh, I can hear some reality, some benefit to that. And so I'll follow it on a positive basis. Or I'll try to look at it a positive way. It is almost inevitable that you're going to take a nap. And it's for damn sure inevitable you're going to get caught at it because you catch yourself at it. Finally, it just apparently I become the means of it. You're then celebrating the common man. You are the new definition of a common man. You're the new definition of trash, dirt. And you can celebrate it all you want to. 
and you can say, well, I've learned a lesson all you want to. And I am not trying to be additionally threatening, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I'm telling all of you, you're a fool if you don't realize this. Every one of you skate that close. It's the way things are wired up. That's why this is so tenuous. That's why there's so few people involved with this, among other things. But you all live, you all skate that close to taking a nap. And I'm talking about a fatal nap as far as this is concerned. So as far as this is concerned, all you got to do is go against one or two of the real unconditional rules I've made about this group for nobody's benefit, certainly not for my benefit, not because of some prejudice I have. It is because that there are certain very common mechanical lower order forces and energies running that will tear apart this group, will tear apart individuals vis-a-vis -vis them attempting to follow and develop higher circuits. It's simply going in two different directions from a 3D view. You're just dealing with new nomenclatures for the whole idea of good and evil. One nap is fatal to people involved with this. Everybody else, it doesn't matter. It just seems to matter to them. But with you, it is true. One nap and caught at it, and it's fatal, because I'll have to throw you out. And you're not going to end up anywhere else. Well, maybe you will. No sense being that pessimistic. After you leave here, you're on your own. But I assure you that it becomes a fatal nap. And it is a kind of struggle that's going on between what seems to be your commitment, wherever it came from, what seems to be your interest, what seems to be your love for this. But you're that close all the time to taking that fatal snooze. And by the time you wake up, a split second later, and you can holler, you can pray, you can jump up and down and say, boy, have I learned a lesson. It was worth it. But that's the end of you. And it's almost inevitable. That's how serious you can look at it. But at the same time, let me point out that the real revolutionist does not look upon life as offering man rewards and or chastisements. The real revolutionist view would be more that life is offering a continual creative potential. It is offering a continual remedial, even a rehabilitating resistance, such as, boy, am I sleepy. Boy, would I like to have sex with that person in the group. Boy, would I like to express my anger to that person in the group. It is almost an overwhelming desire. It is so strong that it must be natural. Hell yeah, it's natural, you idiot. Do you think that you have come upon some great discovery? That, ooh, this is natural. I should not be struggling against this. You're right, you shouldn't. You're part of the common people. You couldn't be more common. But it is not the revolutionist view, and I'm talking about the operational view, not a theoretical view, that all of this is involved in some way with reward and our punishment. That's not what this is about. It's not about what seems to be hard times in your life. If that is what it seems to be, you can't use it because it always seems improper. It always seems out of sync. It always seems unseasonable. You got to look at it in the correct view. Here's my imperfect verbal data, but you've got to see it as being a continual creative potential. And you've got to see it as being a continual remedial resistance. I am tempted to do that which the lower circuits tell me to do. Well, you poor, enlightened soul, you are simply the member of the world's largest club. I'm talking about the largest club. I'm talking about a club that is so exclusive that nobody can get out of joining it, even if you tried to. 
Now that's the depth of perception to go, oh, I'm tempted. Ooh, I almost can't resist. Don't. Perhaps you're not destined to resist. But there's going to come the time that there is only the gate opening once, the gate slamming only once, and your chance has come and gone. But it was not, what I'm telling you now, you should not be looking at such as this and such as I've been describing as being potential threats from me or from life itself to believe that, well, things are arranged in such a way that some people seem to have fairly good luck, some people seem to have fairly bad luck. My life seems to be a mixture of the two, but they, they come at inopportune times even. So if anything happens that would ever get me separated from this, it would be on the basis of bad luck, or maybe, I know, it might be on the basis that the gods or these great secret forces some way are trying me. If it comes to that, they're not trying you, you were tried, you just didn't notice it. It's not a process that they're trying me to see what will happen. They already know what will happen. It's a fait accompli now. You know, it's you dumb motherfucker again. You wouldn't listen to me. But the whole thing is a continuing, ongoing venture of testing you, of them seeing how dumb you are, seeing how gullible you are. Oh, that sounds too bad. Seeing if indeed you're still part of the noble group of the common man. And sure enough, you are. And the gods say, yep, yeah, you're right. He or she, they just couldn't be more common. If you want a definition of common, if we want a picture to put in the dictionary next to the word common, take his photograph. That's where it belongs. Also the recruits need to be reminded, which I will do instantly, that internally and otherwise, that in this apparent struggle, that all victories are someone else's funeral. Now, the religious people, the ordinary religious people believe at right, the other funeral is going to be the bad guys, right? Satan, Lucifer, anti-gods. But now you people are supposed to be, at least when you're around me, you're supposed to be faking it that you're a little more yellow circuit sophisticated to be beyond just a belief in absolute and typical forces against goodness or whatever seems to be your aim. So you cannot simply look at what I'm calling a funeral as being no great loss because it was a bad guy win. Now, if the bad guys win, as you would call it, as ordinary 3D consciousness would call it, if the bad guys went down into the grave, they'd take along who? You know who? All the good guys. You just hop along Cassidy, John Wayne, the Range Busters, Tom Mix, What's his name? Uh, those religious cats, Jesus, and they'd just be one after the other. It'd be like dominoes going. But you need to remember that internally and externally, every time there's an apparent victory, it was somebody's funeral. There is a price. And this is not simply the way I originally phrased this, if you were listening, was not what you should normally expect, or the sequence. I said that not only internally, but otherwise. Whereas you should have been expecting me to say not only externally, but otherwise. That every victory is somebody's funeral. that as far as the imperfect data that we can exchange verbally and a little bit more here between you and I on meeting times, what energy you seem to get seems to have come from somewhere. If you need a transfusion, somebody got to bleed 
For you to get fatter, you got to cannibalize on somebody. For you to have new energy means that somebody has lost some of what they had. I could certainly, and some of you should be able to internally, run off of that almost as fast as Hopalong cast it with one eye closed. But I suggest you also consider that this has pertinence externally. It's not such areas that I normally lay up on, but it has to do with the kind of relationships that go on between people. Another related matter. Let me say to you that the real revolutionist must at all times be extremely alert to seize new power wherever, whenever he or she can is to seize new power, period. Well, for those of you in a more melodramatic mode, seize more power, explanation point. The revolutionist can later ponder the new power's meaning, its use, its consequence. But you need to be, you have got to eventually be prepared to seize the new power whenever you can. And you worry about the meaning, you worry about the use of it, you worry about the consequences of it, you worry about the theory involved later fucking on. But if you don't seize it then, you lost the chance. Anybody with a real potential revolutionary eye might see that there is a connection between that and what I was trying to describe to you some weeks back as operational directives. But I am trying to get you a little more specifically, and I'm telling you in any circumstance involving any apparent struggle internally in you, apparently externally. Whatever times might seem to be pressure points, might seem to be times of trial, what might seem to be inopportune seasons, improper occurrences, there is the time to seize new power. And you cannot get involved, you cannot listen to any kind of internal noise about, is this proper? Am I in some way taking advantage of the situation? Or worse yet, am I in fact taking advantage of somebody else in the situation? You cannot do that. It's a dream, it's an illusion. It's worse than that, it's a waste of time. You have got to seize the power. Now, that's apparently going to come at someone's expense. But if you do not seize it, if you don't say hello first, they're going to say hello first. And the dance has started. And you, my friend, whether you be male or female, short or tall or fat or thin, you are not leading the dance. And you're going to go where the dance goes for some period of time, for some season. You have got to seize the power. Triads are continually breaking down, reforming, and someone it may be inevitable. It may all be preordained insofar as everyone else is concerned. At the lower circuits, it is preordained, if that be true with everyone else. Then it's also preordained in your lower circuits. So forget that. Forget that there's any question. There is no question. If it be true that everything with everybody else is preordained, if that be true, if that is a correct statement, then it is likewise equally correct that all of your lower circuits activities are preordained. But you have got to seize the power that's available that you can perceive in the upper circuits when a situation begins to turn. As you see the triad beginning to move, as you see a new problem arise, as something apparently unexpected happens as apparently the season has ripened for bad news. Right then, somebody is going to seize new power. If it's somebody else, if it's anybody but you, it was ordained. They're not going to benefit. It was predestined that before you could do anything, that all of life, all of human life, 
was so arranged that this situation happened. It was like somebody dropped a stink bomb and it hit you first. It seemed to hit you first. You're not sure if it hit you first until somebody else goes, shoo, and points to you, and now you're it. And once you're it, you can't un -it yourself. Not during that one dance, not during that one episode, not during that one season. When somebody else says hello, you cannot in the 3D world back the film up, and you say hello first. If you don't hit first, you get hit first. If you don't push, you're the pushy. If you are not in that one isolated, artificial situation I am verbally describing, if you are not apparently C-force, you're D-force. If you're not apparently on the offensive, you are on the defensive. If you did not kick, you got kicked. You have got to seize new power. And every time there is anything that's unusual enough, stressful enough, sad enough, fearful enough, dangerous enough, that seems to strike your attention, that's something out of the ordinary. Now, I was not able to walk through this in my general bleary, staring state, <laughs> that this almost got my attention. That almost scared me the potential that this seems to be, have. What I heard almost frightens me to think about, ooh, I might, I might get caught up in that, ooh. If it was enough to bring you out of that ordinary condition, then there was the distinct possibility of seizing some new power, but you have got to seize it. Nobody's going to give it to you. No other party involved even in this group. You can't do it. I could do it to you, but that's not even in the realm of what we're talking about. Nobody else can suddenly stop the dance going on, the situation, the moving triad, and say, do you realize what's going on here? Of course, you people, if you try it, you'd end up trying to describe it in psychological terms. It should be on hormonal terms, chemical terms. But nobody could stop and say, do you realize what's going on? There's a chance right now what's about to happen is you're going to want to feel so-and-so, and I'm going to want to feel so-and-so, and perhaps somebody else is going to want to feel so-and-so, but hey, let's all change chairs. Let me try and feel like you are. But before this feeling, before this chemical reaction turns electrical, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> the power is there to be seized. The opportunity is there to be seized, and it may appear to be a bad time. It may appear to be bad news. But a real revolutionist, if he does not grab bad news and to choke the motherfucker and have it for <laughs> breakfast, it will be bad news. It will cost him. It will be the commercial endeavor that war is. It will be a war. It is a war. It's a struggle between you trying to do something and everything in you that doesn't want to struggle. It's everything in you wanting to see what it is that I can see. No need to stop there, but at least let's say that. We're going to find out the secret and everything in you that doesn't want to see. This just seems to be, to put words on it, your own words, too lazy, too stubborn, too dumb, too tired. A lot of me is just too disinterested. The part of you that wants to see, if it does not seize power every time it can, then every time that there was an opportunity lost, there was an opportunity lost, and you are weaker for it. The parts of you that do not want to operate are now stronger. Every time you seize power, it is a victory. And every time there's a victory, it's somebody's funeral. You got it at somebody's expense. That's the way it is. There is no theory about it. There is no notions of love or Christian brotherhood or charity. You either seize it or it's lost and somebody else got it. Before we get to the epilogue, let us now ponder great thoughts. If not that, let us ponder this. 
what should be your general intentions of being involved with this, and what should be my responsibility in general? And after I thought of that on the way over here, I'm going to give you the first thing that I thought in response. So I think things to myself, and then I think the answer. I guess that's being pretty egotistical to say that I think of all this stuff. I don't want to sound any more psychotic than the draft board thought I was at once. <laughs> no, that's right. It wasn't the draft board. It was that seminary board where I tried to get in school. I, I always confused the two. Well, they both had uniforms, and to me it was the same thing. All right. What should be your general intention and what should be my responsibility? And this was just some that came to me, but it seemed to be a kind of proper sort of summing up, rounding up tonight. After some of what I said, it sounded harsh. I love it that I still throw in things like that and almost sound as though I'm trying to pick up or <laughs> coddle some of you people like, well, I know some of this sounded harsh and I didn't mean it pessimistic. If it sounded harsh to you, it sounded harsh to you. Tough shit. Maybe it was harsh. If it sounded harsh to you, remember this. Appearances are not deceiving. Remember, I told you that. Appearances are appearances. But at any rate, the first thing is just to sum it up for tonight. From one view, one possible set of answers of what should be your general intentions to continue with this. What should be, the, we could consider to be my general responsibilities. And one would be to absolutely encourage the best possible red circuit condition for all of you. The way I'm answering this, I mean this, this is an answer to what should be your response, your interest would be along these lines and then my responsibilities. I was couching my answers on the basis of my responsibilities, but this should also be one set of views of why, what you could, should be considering as being your own interest in this, is the encouragement of the highest possible state of red circuit health. And also should be the encouragement of blue circuit kinds of moves that would help bring ordinary suffering down to a minimal level. And it should also be to help release, break down and release the present kinds of yellow circuit fences and boundaries that you have that were ordained in you. And for me to deliver the kinds of new data that I have been and to try and point you in the direction wherein the higher circuits can develop. And for this set, I could conclude and say, and to assist through all of this kind of map making, instruction, suggestion, rules, tasks, physical activities, to try and assist you in realizing specifically feeling a specific niche, your own place in the quickened body of life. That is the difference between living in this kind of uncomfortable non-stop sense and just existing as some of our former participants say their life would have been had they not met me and then took one nap and I threw them out. 
You cannot realize your place in life's body after the fact. You are back to existing. You are back to playing out your destined role. You are back to the point that indeed any question of can I do anything, is there any freedom, is there not any freedom? If there's not any freedom, then the ideas of whether I have freedom or not is just a dream, and so on and so on. What's the use? And from one quite valid view from the bushes outside the city for the ordinary people, they're correct. What is the use? And that may include your children, your mother, your father, your friends in life. It's not a sad affair because affairs are not sad. That is, the state of affairs as they are correctly stated, not truly stated, but correctly stated. The correct state of affairs are not sad. The correct state of affairs are the correct state of affairs. You can do nothing about it. Well, that's not true. You can waste your fucking time. That's what you can do about it. Not only with attempting to affect the inevitable of other people, but worse yet, attempting to affect the inevitable with you, with yourself. And worse, worse yet, ignoring that you must see to the inevitable in you or it will overtake you and you will be the cheerleader in the celebration of the common man again. You'll be gone. Your nap will have been took. Your day will be over. And nothing strange happened, nothing mystical happened. Hunger, anger, horniness, at least for a split second, took every grand dream you ever had, the finest dream you have ever put to paper and written to me, or at home in your secret diary, of what this means to me, how you wish you could thank me, how you hope that I'm wrong that there is a physically perceivable God somewhere so that at the times when you really feel as though you're seeing into this, and it's more fun than anything in life. It's more fun than hot oatmeal. That you want to be able to someday get hold of God, since I don't seem to be inclined to play along with it, but you want to someday find him and jump in his lap and hug him. But just for a split second here and there, horniness, hunger, anger, lack of sleep. Oh, well, hell, it overcame me for a minute, but hey, give me a break. I'm just, you know, I'm an ordinary person. Right? The closest I must tell you, if anybody's interested to make another point, if you can see it, the closest I come to ever getting the blues is to see some of you go along for months or years and for me to overtly and covertly help nourish you, help prop you up, and to see that there is some non-common interest and commitment in this, no matter that you skate this close like everybody else, but then to see just one second. And to know that it's too late, even when you don't know it. Oh, wait. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I see. Oh, ah, I know what you're going to say, but boy, I learned my lesson. No, you didn't. If you don't learn the lesson in advance, you're never going to learn it. The lesson is that you're skating this close to being the inevitable. You're skating this close to being that common, ordinary, ongoing venture that you have no ability to affect what you do. None. And you won't face up to it. You won't face up that you're cl this close to having none now. That's the closest I get to being sad to let it go on for all that time. In just one second, it's gone. And all of you, I don't care who you are out here, you, you skate that close to it. And if I could be doubly sad or get the blues times two, it would be for that to happen. And then get that inevitable letter the next day, you're saying, ooh, Jeez, it slipped up on me when I wasn't expecting it, but now, now I see. It never happened again. Not only are you dumb, if there was such a thing as a liar, you're not only dumb, but now you're a liar. Because you got to realize it in front, or you can't deal with it. You've got to realize that there is some validity 
to my descriptions, my terminology is talking about revolution and would-be revolutionists. And the common man. There's not an attack on our being, it's not an attack on our sexuality, it's not an attack on our bodies, or an attack on human hungers. But you're going to be led either by the lower circuits, you're going to operate on that basis, that they're going to have the final say so, you're going to take a nap finally when you get tired, regardless of signs on the gates of paradise, you know, give me a break. There's only so much we can stand, right? Right. You got to finally see that there is a reality to this, it's insane, it can't even be logically defended, and it may come down. Now, I know better, but let me conclude by saying this. It may come down to the fact that it's just preordained, it's inevitable whether you can get through this in some way in a lifetime and at least get up real close to the secret, at least close enough that I might be able in your final hours or days to kick you in the ass and make you bump into it. But imagine the kind of fun you had now, all of you in passing, that there's a, it gets a lot, lot better than that. And you can get a lot closer to the secret. It remains to be seen how close you can get to the secret while I'm still alive. It may be the only one person at a time can see the secret, but as I've said before, be that as may, if you get that close, you can always kill me, so that's not the... <laughs> you better be fast and swift, unless, unless I've already put out some kind of sign saying I'm ready to go. But, you have got to be prepared beforehand. You have got to understand that there is a side to you that is as common, and it's in me, it was in all your heroes, it's in every human that ever lived, and by me keeping laying on this common, all you people know by now, this is not, not an attack on humanity, on our humanity, as we could call it. It's not an attack on everybody not involved with this, because from one view, as I've said, I remind you, from one view, they're right and you're wrong to even be involved with this. That's not true, but from one view, that's true. It's not correct. But you cannot drop back down to that level. You do not get a second chance when you are back to that level and in conditions regarding this group, your relationship within the group, your relationship toward me, and all that amounts to your relationship toward this whole activity, whatever the hell it is. There are certain times, certain places that the season is right, the time is pregnant, and you let the lower circuits take over just for an instant, and it's over for you. It's over. There is no second chance. You cannot back up. I can't forgive you. I can't undo it. You can't undo it. It was inevitable if it happens, but if you're not prepared for it now, it is inevitable. But almost all of you here and in other cities, it always has been. It's not just something between you and me. It's always been that way. You know how to read them. In fact, the stories of all of your so-called religious heroes and founders, all of those have a story somewhere about this. As all, all of them have one glaring story, but all of them have story, story, story that are inner quirks within other stories. You cannot be common. You cannot accept the possibility that by being common, whatever you might do will be excused by you, by me, by some other force, by the arrangements that brought you into this. It's for, only for that reason that at times I apparently sound as though I'm a preacher, that I sound as though I'm your father, that it sounds as though, uh, or obviously, is that I have produced some rule, or to say you absolutely cannot do this. Even if you don't understand it, there's just these one or two things you cannot do. If you do, I'll have to throw you out. And some of them I just say, if you do them, you're throwing yourself out. You're killing yourself. You're committing suicide as far as this concerned. If you had the right kind of commitment, your question would have to be, what kind of profit have you experienced thus far? Or put in the crude way I like, if you can understand it, have I lied to you yet? Have I misused you personally? Have I ever taken advantage of what seems to be the relationship of me being in charge and you being the dominated 
Does anyone feel as though I have everything in advantage of you? Then you have to go from that basis and say, well, all right, this sounds silly. It doesn't sound to be of any extreme mystical importance. And therefore, I'm going to let my gonads, I'm going to let my stomach, my belly, my back, I'm going to let it go. And it's over with. And nobody can undo it. It's over with. And you can go on in and celebrate the common man. But this is not the celebration of the common man. And that is uh, Riva Dirce for the public tape. Is it doing it? From our last meeting, I asked you the question of something I discovered that I thought about. Could any of you answer the question, what one thing, what one dogmatic ritual, what one religious observation could a new religion proclaim that would assure its success? I'll answer it for you. Only semi-facetious. The one thing that would assure the success of a new religion, you ready? For them to announce as their holy day of the week, Monday. 